Great. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to see you here. And um, I want to say thanks to writers in Kyoto for this opportunity to share today. And if you're not familiar with Writers in Kyoto, it's a lovely organization, and I've really enjoyed being a part of it for, I think, about, I'm going on my third year now. It's uh, really nice to be in a community of, of people who write and read and exchange ideas about different kinds of writing and, and uh, different kinds of publishing and everything related. Um, so if you're not a part of that organization, I I encourage you to check it out at writersinkyoto.com. So I wanted to share a bit about what brings me here. Um, I, Because of other commitments, I'm actually calling in today from the Canadian Rocky Mountains in British Columbia. And I lived in Kyoto for 20 years. And we relocated here, my partner and I, and a number of other people, friends, students, and supporters, because we were, we wanted to start a retreat center. And ironically, we couldn't find a place in Japan. And we ended up here in British Columbia. And about 10 years later, it became a really good time to buy property in Japan, but but we were early. Um, anyhow, I've, I've kept my Japan connections up, mostly through the Gion Festival. And um, that's how I came to know about writers in Kyoto. And uh, because of my commitments here at our retreat center, I don't get to participate with writers in Kyoto or a lot of the Kyoto community or Japan community as often as I'd like. So I was thinking of how I might participate or contribute. And uh, I thought this presentation might be of value to other people. I wanted to share what I've learned with self-publishing and um, there's a lot to know about self-publishing. We've been through a fair bit with it, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly here. And I continue to learn about it. And fortunately, it's, it's interesting and um, rewarding. It's all good things to know. And one of the things I'm really learning is it takes a lot of people. It's not really self-publishing. It's like team publishing. And I'll talk about that some more too. So I I want to also thank my my really great team that helped me today. Kara here is my tech expert. She'll be in Kyoto with me next month, and she lived in Tokyo and Kyoto. And uh, Richard Nathaniel helped with this tech, and then um, three members of my team: Chris Lolly, Bat Fong, and Richard Sadowski. He helped me enormously with self-publishing my book on the Gion Festival, and uh, I really couldn't have done it without them. So um, I, I kind of think Chris should be here in, instead of me. He knows more about self-publishing than I do, but I, I, I think I can give it a decent go. Um, so please, today, today I want to share with you my experience, and this is mostly from 2020 when my book was published, when I wrote it and published it. And so please, everything I share here, make sure you double check it because I'm sure it's changed and is always changing. So there's um, there's policies, there's functions, and there's costs, and, and those things are always in flux. And but this is the was true to the best of my knowledge in 2020. And so my biggest takeaway in this whole process of self-publishing is, is really the value of community and just realizing how enormous, when I talk about having a team, like the team is just gets bigger and bigger. And um, I feel like the, for me, self-publishing has taught me a lot about community and how I think about community and how I show up in community and um, about growing community often in new and unexpected and surprising ways. And the thing I really like about this is that in some countries, certainly in Vancouver is where I heard of this most strikingly, but they, they consider loneliness an epidemic in Vancouver. And that's interesting because if you've ever been to Vancouver, it's a very social city. There's always groups of people 
spending time together outside and so on. It seems like a, a less lonely city than some. And so to go through this self-publishing journey, a lot of which has taken place at my laptop and still manage to feel like uh, my community is growing and feel connected to more and more people, I think is, is really pretty great. Okay, and I'll, I'll be speaking more on that as we go to. Okay, so um, I've got some slides here, just, just really simple slides. Um, you might want to, if it helps, take a screenshot just to jog your memory about what we talked about. If you could go to the first one and then the second one. So um, these are some things that you want to consider. And I think the sooner, the better. And um, that's that's in an ideal world. And I didn't really you know, I didn't write any of this down. I didn't answer any of these questions before I wrote it, but I had a I had a pretty good idea in my mind. Fortunately, it wasn't wasn't super intentional, but I recommend that you make it intentional. So clarify what your vision is and what your goals are and why you want to write this book. And the reason that it's helpful to be clear about this is because uh, as you're writing and after you've written it, you're going to encounter people who wish that your book was different from how it is and they're gonna you know kind of wonder why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that and and you want to have a good strong sense of that yourself um, about the choices that you made and um if your goals are clear, then it's it's no problem like oh well I didn't do that because x y and z but if, if we don't think about it and just write a book, um, then it can be a little bit confusing and a little bit like, oh yeah, why didn't I do that? And, and you wanna feel really good about the book that you've produced because uh, it's, a, it's a big commitment and you don't wanna just, you don't wanna do a second version, right? Um, unless you have good reasons. Then, then you want to be clear about what your definition of success is. And that can be so many different things. It might just be to produce a really good book, which is an awesome goal and a really great accomplishment. And oftentimes, part of success may include making your investment back. It is a significant investment, um, even if you're not paying yourself, right? <laughs> There's a, an outlay, which I'll go into today. And um, I've heard from a, a publisher that it's considered normal for the investment to, for it to take at least two years for a person to, a writer to make their investment back in self-publication and uh, a, a minimum of two years. So you wanna be really thinking about a, a pretty significant timeline. You also wanna track your revenue and your expenses very clearly because that's the only way you know if you're making your investment back. And um, the revenue, tracking the revenue, it could get, well, I'm hoping it gets easier. It's not as easy as you would think, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute too. Okay, and and that may not be an issue for you to make your revenue back, and that's fine. But you want to um, define what success is for you. Um, some it's worth noting that some books it's maybe not possible to make one's investment back, and that depends on uh, what the topic is. You, you know what the readership is going to be like. Um, if you write it on, say, like the world's most amazing Netsuke collection, and it has a lot of really beautiful photographs. That's going to be an expensive book to produce and probably not a lot of readers. And that could still be okay. That might be a really fantastic book to have in the world, but, but you want to be clear about this. And um, if it's difficult to make your expenses back on your book, there might be other ways to make your expenses back. So that might be, uh, for example, by making an ebook, which is less expensive. Once you have the paperback, an ebook is quite reasonable to produce. Audiobooks, presentations, 
and um, so on. Perhaps, per, and, and new goals may come out of this. You might realize that your goals are bigger, broader, or different than originally. Okay, you can take that one off, yeah, Cara. Done. Yeah, done with that one. Oh, wait, no, I didn't talk about, sorry, I didn't talk about the third one. Go ahead. Um, so then you want to think about your team because you'll need help. I, I'm using that word loosely. You know, your team could be your family and your friends. And um, you want to, it, it would be helpful. I, I didn't really do this myself. <laughs> but this is a lot of the stuff that I learned retroactively. <laughs> But um, if you can figure it in advance, that, that would be helpful because finding the right people for the right task takes time. And so if you can give yourself a long lead time, talk to a lot of people, get a lot of feedback, talk to other writers, talk to publishers in advance um, so that you can make good decisions and um, generate interest too. That'll generate interest and, and that'll give you energy to finish your book. And um, with that those kinds of feedback loops then you can make good decisions and there's no such thing as a perfect book i think you probably everybody wishes like oh i i should have done this or i could have done it a better way but um it's good when when we feel like we made those choices consciously rather than just kind of ending up with something that we didn't really want but we didn't know any better okay so, oh, and so, you know, we're going to, I'll talk for a little under an hour and then we'll have time for questions. You, you're welcome to leave at that point, or you can stay on and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay. So, so here are some of the things to consider. So you really want to make sure that you have some kind of support. Yeah, please. And you know best what, you, you want to think this through and think what kind of support that you need. And, and the support might be cheerleaders, you know, people who are kind of cheering you on. And, um, and we, those people are really valuable because when self-doubt and so on, comes in it's really great to have someone that you can talk to to um, reaffirm your commitment to proceeding with your book and then the support might be other different kinds of professionals if you have friends who are writers or editors or in this case Japanese culture experts for example um, those are going to be really great they're going to be really great supporters for you. Okay. Um, so one thing that it, it's interesting because writing a book is such a big undertaking. It's so tremendous. And, um, and it's really just the beginning. It's a little bit amazing <laughs> that way. And so the book will definitely need editing. And um, you probably know there's different kinds of editing. There's what's called a substantive edit, which is sort of the high level overview. Like, does the book flow well? Is it well organized? You know, is there a nice flow of, of topics or thoughts or uh, whatever your subject matter is? Then there's a line edit, which is, is the grammar correct? Is it making sense? And so on. And then at the end, there's proofreading because there's always typos and so on that, that come in. And um, I got really lucky. Some of the people who endorsed my book caught some, I, for me, I think kind of significant errors. There weren't a lot, but I, I would have been really embarrassed if I put the book out with a, a couple of errors that I had made. So um, that speaks to the support and that speaks to... Um, really inviting people who know your topic well to, to participate in the process. And um, again, the power of community comes in so well here. And I, um, 
you, you probably have friends who are writers or editors or translators in, in that field. And um, Writers in Kyoto is a great resource this way. And SWET, the Society of Writers, Editors, and Translators, um, is also a good resource for, for finding people in this field, qualified people in this field. And uh, it might also be a good opportunity to barter because uh, this is an, an area that could definitely increase the expenses related to your book, but um, perhaps you can do your friend or friends a, a service as well. And, and again, that's a really lovely way to grow community and, and goodwill, goodwill capital. Let's see here. Okay, so another um, really important requirement is formatting. And this might have been my biggest uh, single expense was the formatting of my book. And um, let, let me back up a minute. I'll, I'll return to this topic, but I, I want to share with you too why I felt, why I feel qualified to speak on this topic. So this was our first self-published book. It's called Dharma If You Dare. And I wasn't involved in the original publication of this. That was, um, some of you might know these Japan hands, uh, Laura Bean, Linda Yamashita, and Richard Sadowski got this published. In the early days of self-publishing, we, we just found out that it was possible to do it ourselves. And it was like, what, really? That's amazing. Um, it says 2013, but it feels like it was earlier than that. And um, it was a very painstaking process. When we found out we could do it ourselves, everybody was so excited, but it was, it was a little bit of a nightmare. Um, and that's largely because of the formatting. It's, it's a very, very finicky process where, you know, you kind of hit the backspace and like the whole chapter moves. And um, so I really recommend that you hire a formatter because they can do it much more quickly and it's, it's worth the expense for the, um, to save your hair that you would otherwise tear out. <laughs> um, Dharma, if you dare, went through several iterations. We have a, a German version, a student uh, translated it into German and, and self-published it in German. So that's on Amazon dot de i think it is um german german amazon.com and um and then we also i was a little bit involved with that just because i knew a little bit from the the previous being on the periphery in the previous english version and then we published a 10 year anniversary version of Dharma If You Dare, and I was more involved with that. We um, hired someone to do this. We hired someone to design the cover. And, and the cover was designed, because um, we'll go into cover design a little bit too. Um, the cover was designed to show continuity with our second self-published title, Wasteland to Pure Land, which my partner, Doug Duncan, and I wrote together. And we wanted to show that they were um, related to each other. And so this one I was very much involved in uh, getting self-published and we had a proper book launch and we did marketing and so on. And so that's where I kind of cut my teeth. We, we hired a marketer to help us and they, it's a good idea, but they gave us sort of like 10,000 ideas of things that we could do. And um, it, was, it was sort of hard to narrow it down. So it can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, it's good to have people besides professional marketers to like an intermediary so that you can um, choose wisely what kind of activities to undertake for a book launch. And, and it is a good thing to do because the majority, probably the biggest spike in sales is, is probably at the launch. And so it is a, a good opportunity to take advantage of. There's a lot of natural interest and so you can harness that energy. And, and then um, my, my third experience with self-publishing was, was this book, The Gion Festival. Um, 
and and this is what I'm going to be. This is mostly what I'm referring to when I speak today. Um, because of our experience with these books, we've recently undertaken to publish 17 more books, self-publish, and that's um, my meditation and my Buddhist teacher's teacher uh, has 17 titles that are not available on Amazon and .com and not available as eBooks, and so we've undertaken to do that. So um, it gives you a little bit of an idea of the learning curve involved and what's possible. Okay, yeah, back to that slide, please. Okay, so formatting. Um, so a book, a book this size. Let's see, it's almost 300 pages, I think. And um, color, a lot of photos, maps, schedule, um, different sections, which are color coded. So it was, it was a pretty involved formatting job. And it took five months to format this book, which is really unusually long. They thought it would take a month. They, they quoted me a month. So this is where I really want to caution people to, um, I wish I had a longer timeline because the publishing date was well after I thought it was gonna be well after I planned. And, and that was a really awkward five months because it was gonna be ready kind of any day now for about five months. And um, the total cost for the formatting was $1,700, which is also, wait, no, that's not quite right. It was about a thousand dollars. So um, the interior design was four hundred dollars. This is all in U.S. It was four hundred dollars for the basic interior design, uh, which is a really good price. I think um, for a color book with a lot of photos, I think that they undercharged me. I think they didn't know what they were getting into, but they kept to their commitment, which is awesome. And then there were a lot of corrections. And so that was another $600. Usually you get a proof copy, you get it formatted, you get the cover designed and, and so on. You get a proof copy that hopefully looks like what you want it to look like in as the final. <clears throat> and then you go through it, maybe have someone else go through it with you and look for any errors. And they usually give you, I don't know, maybe like a dozen free corrections or so. And um, anything above that, you pay per correction. And it's pretty reasonable. I can't remember, can't remember how much it is per correction, but I had a lot of corrections to make. So the corrections were 600. And that, yeah, it, it was kind of okay. I, I, I sort of, um, I realized that they committed to a lower price without knowing what they were getting into. And so that speaks to getting a formatter that matches the book that you're trying to make. So we use the same formatter for all three books. And the first two, they were fantastic. They were reasonably priced. They were fast. They were courteous to work with and so on. And um, the first two books hardly are almost entirely text. And so I think that's their base model. And I, I'm sure I told them my, my book has a lot of photos and they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then I think once they got it and um, once the formatter dug into it, I think it was a little bit of a nightmare for her. And um, you, you don't want to set anybody up for that. So <laughs> I think um, if, if I were going to do it again, I would probably post on Writers in Kyoto and, and Sweat and say, you know, does anybody recommend any formatters? These are my needs. I have a lot of photos. I need it organized in a particular way. And um, I think the fact that they were also, they're based in the U.S. And um, I would recommend them for a text-only book. But I think the fact that they were not very familiar with Japanese culture was also a problem. Like they kind of struggled with the diacriticals. And uh, you know how that is where... If you're familiar with diacriticals, they're no big deal. And if you're not, they're just these kind of aliens from outer space. And that was what a lot of my corrections were about is the diacriticals. Um, okay, so you want, if you need images, you want to get a formatter who's skill, skilled with images. Um, 
it would be nice to have a formatter who knows the Japan book market. If such a person exists, I still don't know that. It would, and, and I think there's a real opportunity here for writers in Kyoto perhaps to start um, growing a network of, of writers and um, people in the writing industry who can um, recommend one another. Like, oh, I found a book formatter who knows about Japan. That would be a real find. Um, then such a person might be able to um, advise on format, such as the size. There's the, the size of the book, the binding, the type of binding of the book whether you use glossy or matte, there's a lot of different decisions to make that um, I, I just made kind of what I liked. And that is good because now I have a book that I like, but it's not necessarily great for readers or so on. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, I found out well after the fact that if my book were just, I think about 20 pages shorter, it would be like, like 250 yen cheaper to ship. And so if, it, uh, if it's printed in Japan, um, the shipping is, I think, around 650 yen or so. And if, if it were just 20 pages shorter, which would be pretty easier to do, even if the book was bigger, if the book was bigger, it would easily be 20 pages shorter, and then the shipping would be less. And so the, those kinds of things, it's, it's nice to make informed choices about that. Okay, you wanna make sure, I, I think this is pretty standard, but you want to make sure that you're, you can take that up. Um, you wanna make sure that your formatter can also convert your book, do both paperback and ebook formats. Uh, they're not the same, they're, they're quite different. And um, I think for an experienced person, it's pretty easy to convert to an ebook. I paid US $300 for that conversion. And um, again, that's something that you could do yourself, but I, I really don't recommend it. And that's one of those sort of nightmarishly finicky kind of things. Um, a formatter can also upload your book for you to uh, different sellers and I'll go into this in a minute so they can upload it to amazon.com for you or they can upload to I used Ingram a company called Ingram Spark is our printer for all three books and um, I'll go into why we chose that so they uploaded the files to Ingram Spark for us and because they're experienced they can do it really easily get it done in a day and if you try to do it yourself it would take forever um, I think the formatter charges maybe like $25 or $50 for that. And it saved us a, a lot of work. Okay, so I found out the hard way, I confess, I found out the hard way that um, a book formatter is different from a book designer. So my formatter worked, my formatter and I worked together to do a lot of the design of this book. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with it. They did, they did what I asked. We did a lot of iterations, you know, I sent it back to them a lot and, and said like, actually not that, but this, and, and they, they did that for me. And so in that sense, I got what I envisioned. I got what I wanted, but in, Afterwards, I learned that a really skilled book designer can just give you so much, so much good feedback about how to do it better. And um, especially when you're doing images or if you have special needs, like, um, you know, images sort of, if um, you can't quite make out what the person is supposed to be looking at and working with cropping and and size you know blowing it up shrinking it down my my formatter didn't have the capacity to to play around like that and that would have that would have been good there's um things like sidebars and text boxes maps and good use of typography right good use of color so uh uh 
designer could be really useful for that. And to design a book like this, I was, I was told would probably cost about 2000 US. So we can see that we're already getting up there. Um, I think a thousand, two thousand, three thousand. So we're already getting up at like $3,500. Um, let me see, if your book is mostly text, then you may not need a designer, it might not be an issue. Okay. Uh, you want to ask yourself in advance, do you want an indexer? Do you want an index? So um, a professional indexer for a book this size, again, it's close, close to 300 pages, um, would be about 2000 US. So there's um, definitely some considerations about, you know, making the best book that you, that it could be, and then also what, what you want your budget to be and, and finding the, um, and then what your definition for success is. Because of course, the more the book costs, then the longer it's going to take to recoup those costs, if that's important to you. Okay. Um, book cover design, I paid $400. I looked all these prices up because I wanted to give you a really clear idea. I paid $400 for, so book cover design includes the front, the spine, which is important because that's what, that'll be the first impression for a lot of people. Oh, thanks for showing. Oh, hi, Sashi. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> book dance. <laughs> and then the back of the book, um, also really important. Um, sometimes formatters, my formatter had a book, cover designer in-house and so that was that was great and and she was good um we worked with her on all three of our books and we're really pleased with her and again you want to be prepared to do a lot of different iterations it's kind of a, a patience game okay so you may provide the image I, I i provided this image and then for example we worked with her to together to create this image she gave us a starting image and we we said you know more of this less of that and and so on um sometimes they just present you with maybe six or ten designs and and you pick if you love one you you just go with that there's a lot of different ways to do it and again that it can be really helpful to have someone who knows your field so I think there was a, a Japan, a Japan related book and the designer gave this beautiful cover with an Enso on it. It was, it was lovely, but um, they didn't know that there are already, who knows how many books on Zen that have the Enso on the cover and, and you don't wanna be just another book with an Enso on the cover. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and the book designer didn't really understand why we didn't love mm -hmm. their design. Um, but the cover design is a really great way to engage community. What, what we did for at least a couple of our books is we put the different covers that we were considering or, or else different images. Can we, I was considering for the cover of the Guillaume book and had people vote on which one that they liked best and on social media. And that was, in a couple of cases, like by far the most popular social media post ever. So it was a really great way to generate interest, a really great way to get feedback and also get some ideas about what people are interested in. That was cool. Okay, um, you're gonna need an ISBN number for every version of your book that you make. And, um, I remember in the beginning, we bought one at a time and then we had to buy another one and then we had to buy another one. And finally, we just bought a pack of 10. And for some reason, that was way easier. And we, they stay good forever and you can give them to somebody else. Um, if you, you know, say you have a paperback and you use one and then you make an ebook and you use another and then you change the cover and or do a, 
um, updated version, like our 10th anniversary version, you get another one. And um, I think we might have used one of ours for the German version and so on. So if you can, I, I recommend you, it seemed to really make our life easier to just buy a bunch. Okay. Oh, could you put up the next slide? I think I, I skipped ahead, but um, endorsements. So this is its own thing, of course. People in your field or people who are accomplished in, in their field or related field, um, it's, it's different again, but also a forward is a kind of endorsement. So I'm kind of, you want to think about who you would like to write your forward, who you would like to write your endorsements. And um, again, this really speaks to the value of community. And um, it's a, it's a, I think a significant favor for someone to take the time out to read your book and um, be willing to put their name on it. And um, so you want to think about who is interested in your book, who's interested in its success, and uh, who's qualified to speak to the quality of your book. And then, um, and who will people recognize, right? Because someone could be really qualified, but if no one has ever heard of them, that may not um, necessarily well, perhaps their their uh, position might work. Um, I got some endorsements for this book from from um, the leadership of, of the Gion Festival from some really respected elders. And so I don't think hardly anybody knows their name, but um, their position in the Gion Festival hopefully speaks to that. Um, so these endorsements and forwards, you're also going to use those on the back. Well, you'll use them on the back cover. Um, we, we use them in our books also in the beginning, the longer version of the endorsements inside. Um, we use them on the website and use them on the booksellers website, such as amazon.com. Um, so uh, those are those are really valuable because you can use them so much. Okay, next one, please. Okay, I'm putting printing and distribution together because these days with self-publishing, they're they're often done together. So um, the most obvious one is Amazon dot your country. I'm really making a point of putting in dot something because the Amazon is a rainforest, damn it. And I, I, uh, I don't think Amazon should make us think of a, a online vendor, um, but maybe I'm being finicky. Okay, so Amazon, the, the pros of Amazon, they really have done a great job of making their system easy to use. It's it's very supportive for self-publishing. And of course, it's easy for people to find your book if it's on amazon.yourcountry. And um, when you use them, then the internal system works well together. For example, if you have a paperback and an ebook and you do them both on amazon.com, Calm, then they're going to link together quite easily. Uh, that's not necessarily the case if you use somebody else. And I've heard that you can exclude countries. So um, I want to recommend, especially if your printing quality is important, if you're using images, uh, Book Palette in Japan has the best printing quality that we found. And their prices are very competitive with Amazon.com and IngramSpark. Those are the three that I have experience with. Um, Book Palettes printing is much better. And um, I've heard that if you are using just Amazon, we use IngramSpark, so this doesn't work for us. But um, so I could put theoretically, I, I did, I haven't been able to do this myself, but I've heard that. 
Um, if you're using amazon.com, you can take out, for example, Japan and use book palette for just Japan and use amazon.com for everywhere else. Okay, so that, that could work in your favor. So the, what are the cons of using Amazon dot your country? So uh, maybe you have issues with that company. I'll, I won't go into that because that's a big topic. Um, they do take a high percentage of the, of the sales. Um, the re relatively speaking, the percentage is pretty high. So um, they're, Algorithm affects the pricing in ways that the author cannot control or influence. So I was really surprised last summer, um, Gion Festival book, July wrote, rolls around and somebody wrote me and said, um, I'd like to buy your book, but it's 4,500 yen. And I was like, what? I worked really hard to have that book be un under 3,000. And there, um, there are fluctuations which are based on currency exchange because I think the price is set at um, close to $30 US. And so when the currency fluctuates, and that, that's important to know, then the, the, of course, Japanese yen price and other currencies changes. But in addition to that, uh, last summer, Amazon dot com just put up my book price during july i don't think they choose to do that i think the algorithm does it automatically they start to see sales go up and they put the price up to take advantage of that so that is not such that's not a feature i like um, you can't buy wholesale copies from amazon dot your country so say you're going to have an event and you want a box of 20 or 30 books to sell at your event. Um, I don't think that you can get that at, at wholesale prices or Amazon. I, I might be wrong, but I, I think that's true. But please check on that. Please don't, don't take my word for it. The highest printing quality on Amazon.com was not very good. We, we checked it out for this book and we, that's what made us decide not to use amazon.com for printing it just wasn't very it wasn't good enough quality and that was that was their highest quality available which put the price up close to fifty dollars and um we were kind of surprised that it still wasn't good enough um again if your book is mostly text that won't be an issue for you. And, and maybe if you work with a book designer, it might not be an issue with, for you either. That's, that's a good question. Um, Amazon.com does kind of lock you in. If you publish with them, then you, your book won't be available for other booksellers such as Barnes and Noble and Indigo. So it depends how important that is for you. And again, these, these policies are always changing. So that, that's to the best of my knowledge from 2020, and that may not be current. Okay, so Ingram Spark is another company that ship prints and ships worldwide, and they um, they have printing facilities on different continents. So if if someone buys your book in Europe, they'll print it and ship it from Europe, and so on. They have better image quality printing than amazon.com they you can buy wholesale copies with them so we've really taken good advantage of that and and bought boxes of 30 books at a time and um you know given them to people and sold them on our own and so on um, with ingram spark you can still list on amazon dot whatever and um ingram spark also facilitates your book being carried by other booksellers such as Barnes and Noble and um, they they put it in their catalog so other booksellers see it in their catalog okay so here's some cons about Ingram Spark so Ingram Spark and amazon.com play well together but not that well together so I am still trying to figure out how to 
get uh, for for my book for for this one fun, funnily enough not for this one this one the I think the paperback and the ebook are available on the same sales page on amazon.com but for this one there are two different sales pages and I've had people tell me like oh there was only the paperback or there was only the ebook so they don't necessarily find both versions and we're still trying to figure out how to get them together and have not been able to do that, which is, yeah, not so fun. Um, getting sales figures from Ingram Spark is kind of a pain. It's it's pretty easy from Amazon. So you want to know how many books have sold and um, Amazon.com makes that easy. Ingram Spark, not so much. Their back end is still not so user friendly. And then with Ingram Spark, you cannot exclude countries. So uh, I really wanted to use Book Palette because their printing is in Japan. It's a Japanese um, book printer and distributor. And being Japanese, their print quality is so good. And then I thought domestic shipping would be very reasonable and fast. But now I have three sales pages on amazon.co.jp. So one for the ebook, one for the Ingram Spark paperback, and one for the book palette paperback. And I'm still trying to figure out how to um, just, ha just have one. <laughs> so it is, a, um, we are now looking for a, um, a kind of book sales professional who knows all this backend stuff because it is, it is pretty tough to figure it all out oneself. And so again, I think there's a opportunity here for uh, writers in Kyoto to, um, for writers to help one another when we find this and share this. Okay, lastly, I think most, many of you are Japan-based or Japan-related. So I wanna talk about Book Palette. Um, I've already raved about their printing quality. So, um, it's good. <laughs> you can order books wholesale, so you can order a box of books at uh, just a bit above cost. You can sell retail on their website directly. The, the shipping prices are accessible and fast. Um, the interface with Amazon. Oh, we, this was the first book they ever sold at book palette ever sold on amazon.co.jp. So we were really proud that we could do that together with them. And, um, they were really great about, um, undertaking that new venture together with us. So big kudos to them. Um, you know, with Gaijin, no less, I just, I just think that's amazing. Um, the cons for book palette is, uh, they only ship in Japan right now. I think they would like to ship internationally, but COVID I think set that back. And, uh, the website is a little bit basic there, For example, um, people can't leave comments about the book reviews, but th that may change. And then. Um, you've probably figured this out by now that, um, the thing about these different printers and distributors is that every site that you use, every company that you use, then you need to manage that. You need to manage how your book shows up on their website. You need to manage, um, make sure that it's working. You need to get sales figures from them and so on. Okay, so it's nice to have options and it's it's there's additional work with options too. Okay, so marketing, gosh, you know, I really didn't um, think that much about marketing and sales when I wrote my book. I just thought I would launch it out into the universe and and the universe would take care of everything else. And uh, uh, when you're a writer, you're probably not a marketer. And, and that's something that needs to be reckoned with because books definitely need to be marketed. Just because you write a book and put it on, for example, amazon.co.jp doesn't mean that people will find it. And so you really want to start thinking about who is your audience? How are they going to find you? How are they going to find out? 
what's your marketing network? Who will help you to let people uh, help people find your book? Um, again, speaks to the power of community. Um, you may need to develop some new skills, marketing related skills. Um, book reviews are a really great opportunity and um, kudos or hats off to Books in Asia. Amy Chavez, um, you know, makes it so, has been a really generous collaborator in that sense and does us all a, a really great service through Books on Asia. Uh, and it's another one of those things that's good to plan in advance, find out different book review sites um, and develop those relationships in advance whenever possible. Uh, they like to have copies before everybody else has them. So again, kind of planning that book launch and um, having the book available before it's available for sale. And then you want to know who your market is. And this is, it, it's great to know in advance, but I've been really surprised my market is not turning out to be the people that I thought it was. And, and that's kind of cool. Um, my market, the interest from Japanese people is much higher than I anticipated it to be. I thought it might, I really thought my market was going to be all English speakers. But I, I would say that there are probably more Japanese speakers interested in what I do than English speakers, which kind of makes sense, um, given it's about Japanese culture. Uh, but translating my book was not something that I planned to do. And I did cost that out. And I was told that translating the whole book would cost about $10,000 US. And so that's that's a big, um, that's that's not a something I'm planning to take anytime soon. That's just a big undertaking. Um, you probably want to have a website. You probably want to have an email list. Those are whole things unto themselves and getting good at that and um, working your website and your search engine optimization so that people can find your website is a, a whole other really interesting thing to do. And, um, and then with marketing and sales are also um, book marketing services, which are kind of, they're, they're kind of like clubs, people subscribe to them, and then they get book, um, they get emails with a bunch of, you know, these books are out now. And so one is called BookBub. We used that. It's a little funky because you don't necessarily get to choose your company so it was kind of funny I think I was in there with some like um like vampire romance books or and it was just like oh I didn't really ever envision myself keeping this company but um again it's it's ways to find readers help readers who otherwise wouldn't find you help them find you okay and then sales um so We've talked about it a little bit with Ingram Spark, Barnes and Noble, Indigo, which is the Canadian version of Barnes and Noble. There's something called bookshop.org. I think there's a UK version. They want to do a UK version. They want to do a Canadian version. And it's an online bookstore that supports local bookstores. So um, I have that on my website, bookshop.org, so that people can buy my book through that. And then libraries and academia are another um, great potential audience. And there are, and, and those are kind of specialized. If you want to target those, there are special ways to go about doing that. And then remember, if you want to get your book translated, your whatever you do in English, you're going to basically go through this whole process again in that language. It does get easier each time. But just to give an idea of what you're in for. Okay. Um, so lastly, in terms of basic requirements, the last few basic requirements are, if you could go to the next one, please. Mm -hmm. Community, community, community. Mm -hmm. So you want to be asking yourself, who will your book benefit? 
And who will your book delight? That's a kind of benefit. And um, so this is your team and this is your community. This is your tribe. And, and so you want to try to identify those in advance, but always be paying attention and looking. Cause as I said, it really, there's a lot of surprises in this and, and these people, um, yeah, your community are people who you never thought might be in your community. You can take that off. So, um, social media networks are a great way to develop community. Um, readers are a great way to develop community. Your website is a great way to, to develop community. And um, it's kind of funny. I was having people write me these sort of irritating questions on my website. They said, like, how do I get tickets for the seating area in Guillaume, Missouri? And um, I, I'm very aware that I am not a travel services provider. So I was a little like, oh, what do I do with? I had a number of people asking me this. I was like, okay, how do I handle this? And I realized that they were, of course, potential readers. So, you know, I just tried to be gracious, tried to answer the question and, and let them know that everything that they would want to know about the Guillaume Montsuri is, is addressed in my book. And um, so now they know. Okay. Um, editors, photo editors, other writers, designers, these, these are your members of your community, translators, publishers. You know, if you meet publishers, just um, um, be very nice. <laughs> You'd be nice to everybody. But um, the, all of these people are going to have really great information about what might help your book be more successful. Journalists, um, Japanese culture specialists, um, I recently met, speaking of surprises, um, I recently met online a, a woman who imports Japanese goods into the UK, and um, she was so supportive. She read my book. She loved it. She's going to Gion Festival. She's telling a whole bunch of different people, and she wrote me to tell me that they're all interested, and I never would have thought in a million years that someone who imports Japanese goods to the UK would would be a part of my community. So that that was a really neat discovery. Native English speakers, as I said, native Japanese speakers, a Japanese audience, I think is considerable. And then there's the translation thing. And uh, my friend Masashi here did me such a tremendous favor. And this is a great example. He um, just looked at my website and made a CV for me based on, on what he saw and what he knew about me, put it into Japanese and gave it to me to give to Japanese journalists and uh, helped me contact Japanese journalists in Kyoto, which I never would have thought of. And, you know, and it was like, oh gosh, of course, like of course contact journalists, but it's a really great suggestion from Masashi and he really helped me a lot because I would have struggled to put all of that into Japanese myself mm. and um, some of you may know Julian Holmes <laughs> oh there's that's a photo of uh, me with the head priest at Yasaka Shrine which oh thank you Masashi again great idea of Masashi's he said uh, because Gion Festival is is um, the the patron shrine of the Gion Festival is Yasaka Shrine in Kyoto, and so Masashi said, "Okay, you've got to present your book to the shrine, and you've got to give your book formally as a present, a presentation to the shrine to the head priest." And and I was like, "What? You know, I had never heard of this. I didn't know what he was talking about." And um, and Masashi's very convincing. And he's like, no, you got to do this. You got to do this. And I went and it was great. We met the head priest, very interesting guy, very supportive, learned a lot of stuff about the Gion Festival and dragons that I didn't know before, which became a, another presentation on Gion Festival dragons and a blog. And it was just super cool. So, so great example of um, how connecting with other people can, can help you rethink about who your book benefits, who's going to be interested in your book, and so on. 
So um, big thanks to Masashi. He's like the master at this. Um, some of you know Julian Holmes. He had a great suggestion for a, a bookstore in Japan that would be interested in carrying my book. So, so that's another example. Japan societies, lots around the world, Japan houses, same Japan cultural centers, Japan culture fairs, and so on. Um, all of these are people that are going to be potentially interested in your book. Okay, so um, I think that's that's it from here.